Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. I'm going to analyze today a game that I don't want to reveal who it was played by. Uh, suffice to say it's one of my students on one of the for one of the colors whether it be black or white it remains nameless but I wanted to give you a bit of a insight of my coaching without having my student on the other end thereby somewhat erasing the abuse effect and also just to see how I think and work about chess when I'm by myself looking at these things. I actually very frequently check out my students' games without them being on the line so that A, I get a bit of a preparation for the lesson and B, because uh, I like to follow what they are doing and uh, where I need to put the focus of my next lesson. So, we are looking at a Sicilian English attack. Everything is going fine and dandy. Um, King's uh, castle to the opposite wings and uh, the parties are ready to launch their respective attacks and that's what black is uh, failing to do here right away by playing uh, queen c7 it is a very timid and uh, meaningless move either knight c6 continuing development or immediate b5 uh, was called for uh, queen c7 is really a half measure or as Kasparov likes to call it it's a half move meaning that yes it sort of does what people tend to do every now and then in the Sicilian but really it's not meeting the needs of the position g4 does this is the way how we attack in the English attack g4 g5 h4 h5 g6 h6 checkmate that's what we want okay knight d7 although g5 would come inevitably in this structure I find this move a little bit clumsy too because Sometimes you find that, uh, for example, after knight c7, g5, although knight d7 is more stock standard, sometimes the knight on h5 holds up this attack quite all right for a while. Okay, knight d7, g5, b5, a bit too late. h4, very good chess for by white, knight e5. Yeah, once again, I feel like we really needed to bring these dudes to the game. Either knight c6 or bishop b7 would be would appear to be more logical to me. Uh, the problem with knight e5 is that it's really asking for um, f4. And if knight c4, bishop takes, let's say, queen takes... I would even risk b3 here, to be honest. b3, queen... Oh, back home. And after f5, I think that uh, white's attack is just unstoppable ridiculously strong the only motive that you need to be aware of and that may actually make this look questionable is that uh, b4 is always available as per the stock standard sicilian motive remember these guys that whenever your opponent attacks your piece you always look at how you can attack theirs because now knight c2 is very inconvenient as a result of knight c4 although even here due to the huge development lead um, I think that white is looking quite all right, but potentially I would prefer in this position after b4, knight a4, because um, now after knight c4, bishop takes, queen takes, and either b3 or king b1, we are threatening with knight b6, as well as continuing this crazy strong attack. Anyway, they played h5, uh, and I think that was slightly inaccurate because of b4. And now dropping back here, just, yeah, this looks very, very not cool uh, from White's point of view. And dropping out to a4 would expose the knight to stuff like bishop d7, which is a little bit awkward. Uh, and after something like queen b4, knight c6, uh, it looks like the initiative is shifting to black side, which is really not something that White wants to allow. So h5 here was a little bit naive, but it worked out really well because after knight d7, white just went bang. And I love this move. This is exactly the spirit how this opening is meant to be played. And now if h takes and h takes, and we don't even care that they can take it for free because after queen h2, it's very clear to see that white attack, the white attack broke through before black even did any damage on the other wing. A beautiful finish would be rook d8, check, king f8, rook, uh, queen check, rook uh, knight takes, rook takes mate. That is a beautiful icing on the cake of white's attack. But the game took a somewhat more sensible uh, and competitive way because black simply chose to ignore 
g6 push and played knight b6 which is where these knights tend to go but um the problem is that now this knight is a bit too late to the party and uh the black king gets exposed way too soon so g6 knight b6 and takes uh, took place followed by bishop h3 now i would like to point out that sometimes playing bishop h3 first is even stronger keep on let black basically just stay here and let us keep them guessing about whether we will take there there and what's going to happen with e6 really uh, because knight c4 is inevitably coming anyway so whether the bishop is here or here it doesn't make any difference after takes takes uh, black is still in the same sort of trouble that the e6 pawn is uh, way heavily undermined so they took with the pawn in this position actually king takes is quite frequently uh, employed as a defensive measure because the king here covers e6 so after something like bishop h3 bishop f6 this setup is still I wouldn't say sturdy, but it holds the position together for the time being. Whoops, that was not intentional. Wrong button. So take, take, bishop h3, knight c4, queen f2. And uh, black completely lost the plot here and he took on uh, f3. Um, although I would like to point out that defending e6 is a very difficult task. And strategically speaking, I think uh, white should be way, way ahead here. Anyway, so rook takes f3. Yeah, I have no idea what was going on here in black's head, but after knight f3, knight takes e3, queen takes e3, white is simply a rook to the good and should win the game in the next very few moves. Knight c4, queen d4, bishop d7, knight d4. Very consistent, still attacking e6 as a weakness. Um, love how white is doing this part of the game. Bishop g5 check only. King b1, rook e8. And rook g1. Once again, awesome chess attacking along the g file. The g5 bishop is loose. Brilliant. Bishop f6. Uh, rook df1. Once again, another attacker. Rook d, uh, f1 threatens with rook takes f6, trying to exploit the pin. All of our pieces are actually achieving their full potential. Bishop e5, knight f3, very good. The whole position is kept together by this bishop on e5, defending that, that, and putting some pressure down here. So on some funny day, he might be able to play some tactics like knight b2, fold by queen c3, if the queen were gone. But other than that, if the bishop is removed from this beautiful defending uh, position, black's position should collapse here like... Uh, basically a castle of cards or whatever it's called okay and that's exactly what happened bishop f4 the bishop has been removed and now we are actively looking for tactics for two reasons a because as i said before our pieces have achieved pretty much their maximum potential b actually i should have a c to this list this bishop on f4 is super duper loose and c we are a rook up there is no way that we are going to allow the initiative to slip over to the black side. So this is where you actively start to look for very aggressive measures. And that's where Holy Trinity kicks in, checks, captures, threats. This is one of the checks, that's the other one. Very obviously neither of them do anything that would improve our position. And uh, captures are not really available either. So we move on to threats. We can create a mate in one threat. But it's reasonably easy to dodge. Knight back or bishop drops back. Thereby opening up the queen's 7th rank. But it still looks respectable as a move. So we keep it as a last resort. And then we look at other types of attacks that we like. And that is to attack the queen. And thereby we arrive a stock standard Sicilian sacrifice. That would have wrapped up this game beautifully here. Knight d5 hitting the queen and the bishop and after e d5 the white queen is going to penetrate black's position with elementary power creating three different threats of which one is way too difficult to handle let alone the three of them and black is utterly hopelessly lost the position is 100 percent resignable so this is how this game should have ended and once again every sign points towards violence here fully developed fully mobile white army with more material versus a very shaky black setup with a loose piece 
it's screaming at you that there is a tactical solution to the problem and that tactical solution was ready here at hand by knight d5 sadly wild failed to play this move and in fact played something that i would uh, classify as horrendous which was rook g2 this is a very timid soft really the type of move that is ought to be not good at all in this kind of position because it's just uh way too slow and timid in what it's trying to achieve and i also would like to point out to you that this 95 combination doesn't work because we are a rook up but because of our pieces are so well played uh placed if you imagine that black had another rook here the whole entire variation certainly i can't keep that circle there would still work exactly the same way have a look and imagine there was a black rook here none of the motives would be any different uh in the position and that would be the exact way how white would win and proceed to go on to win this position from here if the position was materially balanced because the features are still the same loose king unguarded bishop beautifully developed white army all right rook g2 a whole read blunder all of a sudden now we are only a piece up still rock solidly winning rook c8 knight g5 once again trying to exploit the weakness of uh, the e6 pawn pawn b4 bishop takes e6 i'm not quite sure why we are not taking with the knight but um I'm not going to criticize this because it allows us to arrive to our next pure point, which is uh, a beautiful demonstration again of how chess needs to be played. Queen c4. So now we need to go like, all right, hold on a second. We are a piece up and our opponent is offering us a queen swap. If that's the best they can do, we are 100% winning here. Let's find the finish off. Because there are lots of very tempting moves, there's a lot of stuff hanging, but calculation and accurate calculation is the absolute key. So, what you do here is you go like, okay, I take, they take rook check, king here. Let's take stock. There is a bishop hanging, but the knight is responsible for guarding our rook on g7, and our knight is hanging very annoyingly. However, we have this beautiful square to go to d5, potentially to f6, and then rook h7 mate. But when we notice that motif, we also notice that the rook will take on e4, hanging the knight and giving us a back rank mate. So then we again have a look at this in a somewhat different way and a little bit more deeply. And this is an ultimate example of what uh, Jacob Agard, uh, one of the best chess authors on the face of earth, calls thinking wide instead of deep. Which means that you don't necessarily need to calculate 75 million moves ahead. But find the best moves on move two, three, uh, move one, two, and three, and then you will be fine. So what we needed to notice here was that after queen takes rook, takes rook g7, check king h8, any rook move on the seventh would create an almost unbearable mate threat on the back rank. For example, rook g7, and now it's ridiculously difficult for black to stop the mate on e8. In fact, there are only three moves that uh, do the trick. One of them is rook home, pawn up, and king to the side. Now, all of them are losing uh, to almost exactly the same motifs. Uh, the more spectacular way of uh, winning this game would have been for white in case of h6, whereupon we have check, or if you like, knight d5 first doesn't really make a difference. And after rook takes e4, rook e8 check, King here, knight f6 is a beautiful checkmate. Really a stunning beauty. And once again, the justification that in this position, there is no way on earth that it's not white who is going to force his will upon black. It's an extra piece. All the white pieces are in dominant position, dominating the center, the king side. The black king is remarkably weak. White must have a way to win here. And that was it by playing rook e7. Uh, rook e8 would have been met by um, probably knight d5 is simplest and now white has got the extra uh, piece and um, not much to worry about um, easy cruisy victory and um, king g8 would have also been met by knight d5 whereupon knight f6 uh, is a mate threat again and once again we kept the two pieces we kept the e4 pawn the game is over 
Uh, instead, however, why I chose to play in this position, check first and then knight d5. And now things got really ugly because after rook e4 we don't have the time to play rook e7 because of the back rank mate. And now we also have a hanging knight and we also have a hanging rook as a result of the hanging knight. So all of a sudden we landed ourselves in a total chaos from a position that was a clear rook up less than 10 moves ago. That is absolutely unacceptable on more standards there is no way that that should ever happen to you and if it does then you really really need to look at the reasons why it did occur and i would say that in this particular game it was very poor calculation and the lack of uh, desire or need to wipe the floor with your opponent and absolutely the most drastically exploit their weakness in their position and basically seek tactical uh, measures to finish off the game as soon as possible. I'm referring predominantly to the knight d5 motif earlier, but even here, this is a very basic mate in one threat tactics that will finish off the game regardless of what black does. So instead we landed, uh, landed in this absolute mess where all of a sudden it's material even. That's a shocker. Uh, that said, White is still winning because these pawns are really weak and the bishop is hanging on h2, not right now, but in the longer run. a3 was played. I don't mind this move, knight takes b4 was playable too, I guess White got enough of from, uh, this nonsense of constant black rank mates, so he wanted to uh, open that up, I'm fine with that. Bishop e5, knight takes b4, a5, knight d3... I personally don't know why white didn't go back to d5, stopping the pawn, putting the knight on a dominant white square. Plus we don't really want to swap the knight for the bishop uh, and we won't be able to do that anyway. So, yeah. Interesting. The reason why I'm saying we don't want to swap the knight for the bishop is because that would leave us with the rook ending, which is massively known to be the most difficult to win even with extra material. Bishop d4... Rook h4, I'm okay with that. Bishop b6, rook g4. Typical example of poor endgame play. No plan, although I have to give credit to the fact that it cuts off the king. But it's very clear to see that the whole entire game is going to be decided on the queen side, where white very badly needs to create a pass pawn and then just roll them up. I would have played here rook c4, activating the rook on the other wing, threatening rook c6 and coming across to a6 from where I'm attacking every single weakness in the black's camp, which inevitably would have led to very rapid um, extra material loss. Rook g4, h6, knight f4, quite good. Rook e8, rook g6, winning again extra material, but okay. Let's go, let's see, rook d6, bishop e3, rook d7, then knight d5, bishop g5, rook a7. This I would classify as a mistake, because if I asked you what your plan was in this position, or how are we going to win this game, the answer would be that we are going to promote one of these pawns to a queen. So hunting this down and having three connected pass pawns is a total waste of space. b4 takes, takes, and from here on you are just running the pawn, or the pawns, rather. Rook a7 is basically wasting time for no reason whatsoever and again, equally more importantly, loses initiative and hands it over to black. And now we are again playing responsive chess instead of just absolutely dominating the board with b4 takes takes and from this point on, literally there is nothing left to be done for white other than just pushing these pawns and nursing them all the way to promoting to queen. Instead, we are mucking around down here, trying to defend every single pawn. Yeah, very, very awkward scenario. Many, many players on this level, which we are talking about between... 0 to 2200 for some reason people don't like pushing their pawns in end games these are your assets that's what you are going to win with when they get here if you don't push them they will not get there that's the lesson to take away from this and finally it did happen the pawns started to rock and roll and surprise surprise they are not stoppable a very clear and easy finish. 
could have happened approximately 10 moves earlier. So eventually White managed to win the game after lots of lots of shaky decisions and uh, turns and ups and downs. Um, I hope that you guys found it uh, just as useful as I did when I went through. I think there is a lot to take away from this game. Both op all three aspects, opening, middle game and end game featured very important, very commonplace mistakes. Good play as well, so credit needs to be given too. But you can identify all those important moments in each segment that could have changed the game, or rather I would say that they, they were the game deciding points. So if uh, you can identify those points and you make sure that in those moments of the game you play forcefully and well enough, that is going to make uh, your chess game a heck of a lot stronger. And that's what I'm hoping to achieve with my student here too who played this game with one of the mysterious colors. Alrighty guys, thanks all for watching. I hope you found this uh, mini lesson useful. I will be back with more soon. Bye!